Okay, starting the recording here, we're here with Matt uh, from the Thunderhead. This is the Thunderhead filament maker from uh, a collaborating project with Open Source Ecology. We were working on, on doing a workshop where we do a one-day build, not a one-day, but a weekend build of the Thunderhead filament maker. Uh, the general perspective here is Matt, also for you, is we've already built actually the actually partial build of the Lyman filament extruder. And since you guys have opened up the Thunderhead filament maker, um, we yeah, are. I call it extruder. You call it extruder, yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're collaborating. So, so the good news here is that this is officially all open source, so we can collaborate and look at bringing. Um, this open source filament maker to to the public and this one works with PET and there's a whole discussion why PET was chosen that is because it's a very very widely accessible plastic but it's also much harder to extrude and that's why this this device that we're talking about right now has a water bath it's much more complex than the Lyman filament maker which is just simple air cooled uh, Matt you want to say a couple more comments on on your project a little bit just to introduce to the public or yeah so uh, perspective um, yeah maybe Matt if you uh, uh, sorry sorry Matt if, if you can just provide some perspective like where you are with the project um, and just just the website where you guys are to get all together with the project because on our side we pretty much did a partial build of the Lyman we kind of stalled it because actually one of our uh, PID sensors wasn't working so we couldn't build it that one day but anyway we're, we're looking at this as joining forces and um, integrating this knowledge into a workable product that can do all kinds of filaments so but yeah go ahead Matt okay so uh, I work with uh, Tech for Trade which is a, an NGO that uh, does a lot of work in East Africa and our Kind of goals around developing this extruder is to make 3D printing accessible anywhere in the world. Um, so a big part of that is getting filaments anywhere in the world. And you know, most of the plastics industry is based on pellets. Um, even in the recycling industry, like the first thing people do with uh, waste plastics is get it cleaned up and turned into pellets. Then it goes on to remanufacture. And so we've been working on this extruder to make it possible to extrude directly from flake instead of pellets. Um, and uh, yeah, we we went with PET because it's something we do that everywhere in the world and it prints very well. Uh, uh huh. <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, you know, I would say it prints far better than ABS um, prints as well or better than PLA uh, and it's also got pretty great physical properties I mean that's why they use PET for pressure vessels um, so, so those kind of great aspects of PET you know make it worth going through all the trouble of making filament out of it which is kind of the difficult part Right. Tell me just a little bit more about the pressure vessels, because lately I've actually been thinking about storage of either methane or hydrogen and uh, oh, yeah, so ineffective the ways to meant, uh, do like it. Two liter soda bottles. Oh, yeah, which is yeah. different. But what's the PSI altogether? Like, I mean, we've considered things I like... Think yeah. Go ahead. Uh, a two liter pop bottle will, I think, they explode around 120 psi, um, mm -hmm. and they're quite thin walled, so it's it's a, a pretty amazing uh, polymer. Um, right. It's a really tough polymer. Uh, you know, so unlike PLA, um, you know, if you if you have a, a piece of it and you bend it, if it's in a, its amorphous state, it will uh, just deform instead of uh, snap. Uh -huh. So uh, PET, one of the challenges with it is that um, it also crystallizes. So in its crystalline state, it's brittle like glass. You know, you could crack, you, know, you could snap it and cut yourself on it. Um, so so um, it's, a, it's a pretty 
pretty interesting classic for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I remember something like uh, ABS is like about 8,000 PSI for its uh, compressive strength. Do you know what that is for the values for PET? I, I couldn't tell you. Oh, here it's actually megapascal, 3,000 MPA megapascals. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, anyhow, for accessing the um, info, which is maybe I'll just go ahead and we can pop that, that up on this first page here. Whoa. Um, so, yeah, actually, I just looked at the values. It's according to Wikipedia, if it's 3,000 megapascal, that's 43,000 PSI. That's much stronger than ABS if that's if we're talking about the same thing here. It's, it's got Pencil pretty impressive strand. physical properties. That's, uh, I mean, I, for me, like this, Young's um, you know, since I'm not really working on pressure vessels right now, uh, I'm more interested in how it melts <laughs> yeah <laughs> and where it breaks uh, at this point um, yeah, yeah 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 okay let's continue uh, so so going with it mm -hmm. okay so I just popped the address into the the first page uh, there that's uh, where github uh, where tech for trades github repositories will be yep they're right like I think I made the first con well, we made a first commit like years ago, but then it just kind of went dark for a while, and so like essentially the first commit kind of happened yesterday. So it's you know in the early stages, but in the next month or two should get filled out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, as far as the actual code, is it on there under diameter sensor and GitHub? I'm yeah, seeing so yeah that, that INO. Yep. I see that. Yeah. Like if I'm on the diameter sensor folder, it's got diameter calcs dot h diameter underscore sensor dot ino. What do you do there? You you download the whole repository and open it up, up in Arduino environment. Um. Yeah. So for the diameter sensor, uh, in in order to get it working, you know, this is where we were talking about calibration. Yeah. Um. You have got to. First, so, so heading back to, to just the kind of main directory for the non-contact diameter sensor, um, first thing you would do is calibrate it. So you'd upload the calibration file to the Arduino, and then you connect the, the basically there's a whole process for connect the diameter sensor up to a stepper motor that's on the calibration frame. Mm -hmm. And then there's another file in there in the diameter sensor UI. It's, um, it's called diameter sensor UI. It's a it's a processing file. Um, have you? I don't know if you guys work with processing. Oh, uh, haven't haven't much. Um, okay. Which which one is that? Which one of the files there? It, it's it's in the it's in the diameter sensor UI folder and it's called diameter sensor UI dot um, and so all those other files in there are basically helper files you know with, with different functions. Uh -huh. and, dot PDE um, is processing. PDE, yeah, that's a, a file that processing will read. Uh, Arduino IDE also reads them kind of. Sometimes because my Arduino IDE is loading up my processing. Uh, yeah. The files. But anyhow, so basically, when you run that processing file while connected, while the computer's connected to the diameter sensor, you can control the, the diameter sensor from the computer, and the computer will run the. Um, run the the uh, calibration standard across the uh, filament diameter and record it just to gobs and gobs of data about the you know where the shadows are 
So it basically corrects for the, the inconsistencies in the lens um, and the laser because the, the intensity of the laser light is not even across the, the entire sensor. So it basically takes all that data and then crunches it down and then produces um, some you know, crunch data that you then add to the uh, file. Let's see, I can show you. It's in, um, in the main di the diameter sensor folder. If you go in there, um, you might look at a, a, a file called leftmap.h. And if you open that up and scroll down a ways, um, you'll Sorry, see which folder? A, so that's in uh, diameter sensor. Under, under diameter sensor, okay. So this is the code that controls the diameter sensor when it's working with the extruder. Is which one? Diameter sensor dot ino. Uh, that's yeah. So that's the main, uh, the main file. But so if you look at say the header file called uh, left map. Okay. So if you click on that and open it up and scroll down a ways, because the first few pixels don't have any data for them. Okay. Um, but then after that, you'll see that um, basically it's a map where it, it has a pixel and it has a location for that pixel. Um, and basically it's, you know, I don't know how many data points, a few pixel. hundred data points or so as opposed to thousands of data points um, that uh -huh. allow the diameter sensor to take into consideration oddities in the, in the setup. This is the calibration file that you have to generate? Yeah, so you generate this file. This is just one that was the last one used, basically. Um, I need to come up with a good system for tracking files so that you know you know, uh, what data has been uploaded onto your, your, uh, your uh, diameter sensor. Yeah, um, I just have a yeah, question here. So, so is, is this diameter sensor the same one that goes on the printer itself, or those are completely different? No, those are completely different. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this one just measures in one dimension, yep. whereas the one that goes to the printer measures in three different Okay. Um, although I found a dramatic improvement when I only used two of those angles. We, we can talk about that uh, a little later. Okay. Um, so anyhow, that's just kind of a snapshot of, of how the diameter sensor works. So there is, you know, so there's one kind of drawback is, is actually scanning that standard across the filament takes some time. Although, I, to be honest, I've only calibrated like three diameter sensors, so I haven't done a lot of work into figuring out like exactly how much data do I need. Um, right. But my thought, if, if the inconsistencies are um, small and few between, but you want your diameter sensor to work all across the whole range, then you've got to find them, so you need, you need to do make small steps. What's your, I mean, what's your basic algorithm? Um, basically, so it, it um, so first it homes the, the standard, and then it'll move to the first position, and uh, diameter sensor collects the data, so you get a bunch of pixels uh, that are at different brightnesses, yeah. and it scans from one side to the other, looking for where the brightness yeah. is down. You know, and so it says, okay, that's that's the edge, and that's yep. going to be at a certain pixel. Um, and so then it says, okay, this pixel is at such and such location, and it the, the, the way I know the location is because the carriage for the um, for the that moves the standard back and forth is driven by a screw. So I basically know how many revolutions I've done to get to that location. Um, so I know. Oh, I see. 
like the actual location and then where the diameter sensor is seeing it at. So I make the map between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so that's pretty much how, how that works. Um, if you were to, on, I was going to say, if you, is it possible to do another system where you're just taking one, one, basically one picture, uh, so you don't have to move the, what are you moving the, the light beam? Is it a little laser? I'm moving, moving the, the standard, like a, a small piece of film. So, so the filament moves sideways across the sensor and the shadow moves across the sensor, but because the laser beam is perfect, the way the shadow moves, you know, you might think of it as like yeah. what it what the shadow might look like on a hot day over over pavement where the where the index of refraction of the air is changing so the shadow's kind of ripply. Um, okay. So, so <laughs> taking into account that you know that imperfection. Okay. Um well, then another another issue. Um, I don't know if you put it on the dock. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it, it kind of goes in there. That so the collimated beam isn't perfectly collimated. So the other thing, not only side to side is an issue, but forwards and backwards. So like the closer you get to the laser or to the sensor, um, might give you a different measurement. Okay. Uh, do you, so, uh -huh. in the overall electronics scheme, do you have two microcontrollers? You have one for the the filament sensor, and the other one is for extrusion itself. Or those? How many mic? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's the main Arduino that controls everything, and it also controls, so, so, so it, it coordinates everything, and it controls everything that happens on the main extruder body. So, eating the, the, the different parts of the barrel, uh, running the screw, um, I guess that's pretty much about it on the main barrel. Um, so it does those things, and then it also displays the menu system um, and stores like your extrusion parameters and that sort of thing. Okay. Then there. Um, so then the other kind of other things that are attached to the extruder are kind of built as like plug-in modules. Um, so they all use the same. Uh, four wires to connect, which is a ground 12 volts, and then the two I2C uh, data lines, the SDA and SCL. Um, so that basically, it's nice in the sense that, like, one, this diameter sensor, you could use it on something else. And so you could design that thing to just have that same connection, and you can. Uh, Use the diameter sensor to say measure yarn okay. on the yarn machine, or, or as you drop nails past the diameter sensor, it could image them. Or, yeah. You know. All What's sorts of tell me about the third and fourth controller? What do those do? Okay, so there's another di diameter sensor that um, is uh, on the end of the water bath, so that. As the filament comes out of the nozzle, it necks down. So yep. the, the first diameter sensor doesn't measure the final diameter of the filament. It kind of measures what's coming out of the machine. And then that last diameter sensor measures what's coming out of the water bath, where the, the filament is cool at that point and locked in its final position. So it's kind of the quality control to make sure that the initial diameter sensor is at the right set point. Um, uh, but does it have I some feedback or, it's, I mean, what can you do about it though? Okay, so that's your... 
it feeds so back to I, them. Yeah. You know, and I haven't done this yet. The, the idea would be say that the, the so we'll call the one in the image here uh, primary uh, diameter sensor, um, and so it's always adjusting the outfeed uh, to to maintain a certain uh, yeah. diameter of that of that filament that's necking down. And then at the um, at the other one, the you know I don't know we call it the, the QA diameter sensor. Um, basically, when it sees that that you know say it's going to be watching over a period of time, and if it sees that the diameter is on average away from where it's supposed to be, it will then change the set point for the prime for the primary diameter sensor. Okay. Um, you know, because we need a, like, we need a way of, of saying, oh yeah, we're at the right set point, or no, we're not at the right set point. Um, and so right now we do that manually. We turn it on and run it, and say, oh, the set point's three millimeters, and that's given us one point seven five millimeter filament. And then instead it's given us two millimeter filament, we might change the set point to two point five millimeters, or something like that. You know, it's kind of manually tune it. Um, but the idea is that later on it would, it would just run itself. You know, so one, one of the things we'd like to get this to is the point where you turn it on and punch go and you know, sit back and, and drink coffee. Yeah. Uh, just the news here. Uh, it took 30 minutes for the file to open. <laughs> Wow, but but it manages relatively okay. I mean, I could see the whole thing. Uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah. There are a lot of parts in there. How long does it but take what, take for it to open in SolidWorks? Uh, Twenty seconds. And are you on a desktop or a laptop? On a desktop. Yeah. So. About the same on my laptop, maybe a little bit longer. Okay, I heard that FreeCAD, like if you have a desktop, uh, it's way way better. So I'm gonna try that, see how what the difference there is. I was gonna get a desktop. Um, okay, yeah. but go anyway. Um, so on these files, there there are actually maybe a ton of files on there that, right? You know, like you said, in terms of file simplification, are just not needed. Um, you know, like there's I think an entire like an Arduino Nano with a RAM board, or not with the RAM board, sorry, there's an Arduino, like the Arduino Nanos are all modeled on there, I think the Arduino's modeled on there. Um, so yeah, you know, stuff where really you can just put a box on and call it. You've got like full models of that, down to like every pin? Yeah, like, yeah, like the Nano is like, I just got it on GraphCAD. Um, yeah. The, the thing that I, I didn't, want to design like I've, I've had issues before where I design stuff and I go to put it together and there's a crash that was unexpected because I don't know cooling fins were sticking up too high or something like that and so I just it's like oh I can just plop that in there fine uh, but yeah it definitely slows stuff down yeah uh, yeah there's also I think the main gears um, because they're herringbone gears uh, also probably slow you way down. Yeah. Um, the rebuild time on those gears in SOLIDWORKS is like 10 minutes. Uh, so it was, uh, what do you mean re by rebuild time? Basically, like if you change the file and it recalculates the geometry, oh, um, the, some of the feet, the, the, the curved teeth, the, you know, it's like a curved involute tooth. Yeah. Uh, or involute tooth. A, a while. Um, the good news is, is we are dumping the herringbone gears. That was not necessary in actual uh, 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 What are you cost. moving to? Okay, so next step. So, so that's kind of on the diameter sensor. So I think that the main lesson there is that it's, while it is cheap, it's not perfect and it takes some time to calibrate. Um, so here, I'll put a, a new guy in here. Um, next thing, um, oh, 
so kind of a, a, a larger scale issue that is not kind of in any one component is um, the movement of the filament in the water bath. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, unlike air-cooled uh, extruders where, say, like the lime, Lyman, um, or we actually, this kind of the, the early, early version of this was for ABS, um, so it was also air cool. Um, the, there, the, the filament kind of gradually cools down to its final temperature, so you get this slowly changing uh, melt strength. Yeah. Um, so if the filament giggles at all, it doesn't really cause any problem whereas with us we've got about three centimeters of liquid filament coming out of the, the nozzle and then right when it hits the water it's pretty much you know at least the outer surface is solid so if you jiggle the filament around while it's in the water those movements get frozen into the filament um, so it's not straight Mm -hmm. And then when those parts that are not straight hit the rollers, they jiggle the filament and translate that motion straight back up to the same spot, and you have the problem all over again. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where sometimes if, you're, if things aren't set right, you can really fight instability where basically the, you know, waviness of the filament is creating even more waviness in the filament and things can get out of hand. Um, Inside the water bath, how do you get the, the unstraightness when, when there's any... How, how does that happen? I mean, the water is very still, so how does it get to jiggle? Yeah, let me... It's kind of a, a big combination of things. Um, but so... One of the issues is say that the, the plastic doesn't move through the through the, the barrel of the extruder at an even pace. Um, yeah. One contributing factor to that, um, uh, I can just add in a, a, a thing. It's called screw beat. So basically, at the end of the screw, right there's there's uh, there's basically one flight on the screw. And so as that screw goes around in circles, it creates a pressure wave um, that has a frequency of the revolution of the, uh, of the screw. So that pressure wave causes varying diameter and different thicknesses of filament bend uh, with different curvatures. So when the filament goes around a roller, Sometimes it bends more easily, and sometimes it doesn't. And so, um, let's see here. If you look up on your very first picture that you got in there of the extruder, yeah. um, imagine the filament going diagonally across the water bath and going under that roller at the very end and then up to the diameter sensor. Yeah. It goes around that corner. Sometimes the bend is tighter, and sometimes it's not as tight. And that little bit of motion translates back to the nozzle and maybe stretches the filament a little bit more or doesn't stretch it as much. Yeah. And so that, uh, I mean, you know, because we're, we're trying to control teeny tiny changes in the filament, so it's very, very touchy. Um, Would this be easier if you were making 3 millimeter filament? might be and honestly I haven't tried um, mainly for historic reasons at this point actually now we could definitely do it um, so, um. Uh, yeah they, you know I think an another thing is like if you look at industrial lines um, the filament typically goes in a straight line or uh, well oftentimes there are water baths where the where the filament goes in at a curve, but then it'll go straight for a real long time. 
um, so things pulling it, uh, I think just, um, Why haven't you, like for example, angled the actual extruder so you don't have to bend it and the nozzle is straight and just goes very slightly under the water? Have you considered that? Or? Yeah. So it gets difficult because so another difficulty with um, with PET is that the plastic has it's, it's uh, has a very low viscosity uh, when it melts. So its melting point is very high compared to to most other thermal plastics that people use in food printing. So like PLA, you know, you can print say, around 180 to 200 and uh, ABS, let's say, let's say 220. And uh, PET melts at around 250. Um, yeah. And so, and then when it does melt, the viscosity is really low. But when it comes out of the nozzle of the extruder, it's like honey instead of like chewing gum. Yeah. Um, so it has uh, what's called a, a really low melt strength. Basically, its resistance to being stretched is like nothing. You know, it's like stretching honey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so pulling it into a water bath horizontally is kind of hard. Um, so, uh, what you can see on the uh, and you're saying uh, vert you 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 need to pretty much go vertically down. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so originally we did that. Um, to just go vertically down into the water. Um, what we have done instead is, if you look at, um, on the third slide, there's a brass tube that uh, comes out of the end of the extruder and is pointed in between the diameter sensor. Yeah, the extruder next down label. Yes, it's, that's pointing at the very end of the, the brass tube. Uh huh. So that's the that's the cooling tube on the extruder. So that's like something that is not present in industrial extruders. Um, and the idea behind it is to cool down the filament, or cool down the plastic before it exits the extruder. And in doing that, we increase the viscosity and the melt strength of the filament. Mm -hmm. um, so when we do that, we're able to get the filament not to be a totally straight line between the nozzle and that ro roller at the end of the water bath, but a lot straighter than without. Um, yeah. Earlier on, it was quite a a curved line, you know, where it would just basically, you know, if you if you tried extruding at an angle, it would just dribble out of the extruder anyway. Um, and then in this, uh, is how many of these have you built? One, one prototype, or how many prototypes? Um, well, I mean, I've been at it for years, so um, I mean, first one. I mean, it's kind of started as like the ABS extruder we had mm -hmm. that we tried running PET through, and then we, you know, slowly made changes on this over the years. Um, there's an earlier prototype in Tanzania. Um, the one that was in my shop is now in Nairobi. Um, but I mean, I guess there are like those would probably be the main. Mm -hmm. um, they're like both one that went to Nairobi has had every single part changed out, you know, probably multiple times, or at least many of the parts changed out. Um. Right. Uh, I mean, the, my first impression on that is that to me it seems that 1.75 millimeters is more difficult than three millimeters. It's just, just brute, you know, just brute size probably will, will help, right? Or no? I don't know. So that so so before the cooling tube, even getting 1.75 was difficult because the filament was so so uh, 
we, you know, so uh, with such low melt strength that um, by the time the filament hit the water, it was already neck down to like 1.2 millimeters. You know, we had initially we had a real tough time getting the, the diameter of the filament up high enough. Um, it just stretches out so much like that as soon yeah, as it leaves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, so it's kind of like the way you could combat that is by making an extruder that just pushed more filament through, you know, so kind of like using, you know, just turning up the faucet. But then you get into, you need bigger heaters, you need a bigger motor to push it through, then all your power supplies get bigger, you know, so it's just kind of chain reaction upstream. Um, so... Anyhow, the cooling tube so far has, has worked pretty well. Um, but yeah, it, I think experimenting with three millimeter would be a great thing to do, especially because there are quite a few three millimeter uh, you know, printers out there. Um, well, the advantage of... Say again? Well, the advantage of three millimeter printers is that they can also print with 1.75 in the same extruder. Like, for example, the Lulzbot Mini, I mean, I, I could print 1.75 in a 3mm extruder. Mm. So there's, yeah. uh, there's that issue. For us, I think it, the, most, the most important thing is, is we want to be printing larger scale items. So uh -huh. uh, probably 3mm is desirable for that. Uh, just mm -hmm. Also in the manufacture of it, I mean, it's if you have... Uh, much less length seems like it's easier to at the end of the day to extrude like the spools like uh, it seems it seems like if you have less length it's easier it makes it technically a little easier to to manage the thicker filament or, or is that not the case uh, in terms of spooling it or yeah spooling and then potential tie-ups when you're actually using it. I, I would say, in my experience, using three millimeter and, and one point seven five, because pretty much I used all three millimeter until I started making one point seven five, and now I use the mix. I don't have too many problems between the two. I would say one point seven five strips out maybe a little bit easier if you're using like or something like that, but um, or it buckles more easily. But honestly, the PET, because when it does melt at such low viscosity, I think that's what makes it really easy going through a printer. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, you saw the picture of that tube we printed. Like, yeah. You know, came out dynamic. Um, yep. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm getting, I like, we, we were starting to get prints that are like better quality than the prints I was getting with you know, industrial manufactured PLA. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Tell yeah, me. I, I, you know, I think I think really, you know, maybe that's kind of the other sort of thing about the conversation. Just like, yeah, there are a lot of unknown areas at this point um, in the game. So. Yeah, I, on three millimeter, I will I will say that that uh, I am not sure. Um, uh, if so we, another issue that causes yeah. movement in the water bath is that the outfeed rollers um, Sometimes they don't they don't always pull the filament through uh, at the rate that they're supposed to. Um, that can be due to, for example, um, let's say there's like maybe you didn't get perfectly clean plastic and there's like a little chunk of junk in there or there's an air bubble that creates a, a bump in the plastic. Sometimes that'll jam on the rollers. 
um, sometimes I think just because of the sometimes it just seems to slip on the rollers. You know, so we hang weights on the rollers to like increase the, the pressure between the two rollers and pinch the filament in there. Um, but I suspect that sometimes it's slipping when it's not supposed to be, even when it's kind of the filament. Um, it's pretty hard to see, you know, because the teeny tiny changes so you're, um, you know, will have an impact on the diameter. Um, but again, for the most part, it's pretty good, but that's going to be a, 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 you know, a lot to figure out. I think, I, you know, just kind of overall, I'm not sure what the right geometry is in the water bath to make sure that the movement is very steady. That's an area that definitely needs to be improved. Tell me just, just a little bit more about the screw beat. Which specific feature of the screw makes that happen again? So there's like, um, imagine, so at the very end of the screw, right, the, the screw is basically one helix, right? Yeah. It's like a, a cut thread. So there's one edge of the screw on basically from the center point out to the edge. Um, so it's on one side of the barrel and not the other. And so as it rotates uh. around, it creates a pressure wave that mm -hmm. moves around in circles um, yeah. around the screw. And then um, the other thing that happens is, is as, the, as the screw's going around in circles, the polymer is being spun up, right? And all those, so that kind of orients the chain in the polymer, even though they're liquid, you know, it's like spaghetti or something like that. So, so it kind of has this spiral shape. Um, and so if you're just to let it come out of the, uh, of the extruder as is, you would get, it, would, it looks like spiral macaroni and our, you know, we could make our ABS extruder extrude full spiral, uh, ABS, you know, if we set it up just right. Um, so then in, in our extruder and in most extruders, there's a part called a breaker plate that's just after the screw that's like a plate with a bunch of holes in it and it basically forces the polymer to go straight through instead of continue spiraling. And that reduces the effects of screw beat. Um, but again, it's one of those parts where we've, we've done a few different breaker plates, you know, but I don't think we've a uh, hundred percent eliminated screw beat from the machine. And so that little bit of screw beat could cause a little bit of waviness. And some of those waves could, you know, again, feed back into, you know, cause some destructive uh, sort of motion in the... Hmm. Uh, screw beat. Yeah, right. So that breaker plate is a little... A disc with a bunch of holes in it, the center hole being the largest? Yes, and that center hole um, actually is for extraction. Um, so that gets tapped and a three millimeter screw gets put into there with the thread sticking out so that when you want to remove it, you can screw a bolt onto the end of that three millimeter screw and then you tighten the nut with the washer down on the barrel and it I see. So the in a CAD, you don't have threads on an inner hole. There's really threads in there. Yes. So that's just a three. It's just a tapped three. I think I. Oh, you know what may not be in there, which might be in the, um, in the CAD is a note to the um, tap with a. Uh, but yeah, I don't think the screw is even modeled. Right. Yeah. Uh, but so that's a that's a part of the machine that I would like to change. I feel like it's something where when you separate the the cooling tube from the barrel, that part should just be in your hand, so to speak. You know, possibly glued onto one side or the other, but you know, with uh, cool plastic. But um, I 
don't like that it's something that you have to extract from the machine. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyhow, it's, you know, it was kind of a balance, I guess. Um, and, you know, we can, you know, we can change those, those parts of, as, as we go. Uh, yeah, so that's the that's the function of the breaker plate. And then in most industrial machines, there's actually a melt filter in front of that, which is basically just like a a piece of wire mesh, you know, like like the and actually something that you might use in other small scale extruders have them. It's like a, you'll get a stainless steel wire mesh for like a faucet, mm -hmm. and put that in there, and so that'll filter any junk out of your plastic. Yeah. Um, the issue is that you'll pay a price in terms of throughput uh, with that in there. Yeah. So the one, one that I read about that had that, I, I remember them saying that throughput went down by like 15%. Of course, it depends on the mesh size and everything. So, uh, yeah. Mm hmm. So the other, I guess this uh, waviness of the element kind of gets at it that, you know, that I just mentioned um, screw beat. And then I think in addition to screw beat, we'll just put in um, inconsistent flow. That like um, flow through the extruder and I think, you know, uh, this is not just our extruder. Like, um, flow isn't always even, even though sometimes it seems like it should be. Um, like, sometimes plastic might melt a little earlier or a little later and stick to the barrel a little earlier or a little later or stick to the screw when it's not supposed to. You know, like, different things like that can cause the filament to move, the plastic to move through the barrel. Um, at a varying rate. Yeah. What's what's the current yeah. cost of the overall extruder? The current what? Cost. Just to for cost reference. Yeah. Around a thousand dollars for the parts. What's the most uh, expensive part? It's gonna be part of the documentation. I haven't re I haven't I've made a lot of changes on the extruder and I haven't gone back through the DOM, so that's gonna be part of my I'm doing documentation now. Right. What's the most expensive part? The most expensive part right now is the motor. Um, and so that's a, a good thing to, to talk about right now. So the motor is basically the biggest stepper motor we could buy. Um, and why in the world are we using that in, as opposed to another motor? Um, the answer is one, I'm familiar with stepper motors, and so for me that's like easy speed control um, and easy coating. Uh, so that's part of it, that's a pretty lame reason. Um, How much is that motor? I, say again? How much is that motor? That motor plus the power supply is about 300 USD. Um, Mm-hmm. And you've got some a couple of other smaller steppers on the other rollers? Yes. Um that stepper cost so the big one plus the power supply costs three hundred and thirty five dollars last time I bought it. Um other stepper motors are all like stuff you would use in a, in a 3D printer. Um, so those are like 10 bucks each. You know, um, it just uses uh, uh, you know, a little stepper driver. Yeah. Um, so what I think, you, you know, 
part of the reason for, for using a, a big stepper motor is so that we could vary the speed easily and um, you know once we kind of know say if we settle in you know we're always going to be running at 50 rpm or something like that we'll probably just get an AC motor and gear it down to the right speed and then just run it with that um, I think that would be a lot lot cheaper solution um, but yeah for now the stepper motor just makes it really easy to, to experiment with yeah And then, well, the other thing is, you know, if you do run different types of plastic, having that ability to change the speed um, could be very nice. Um, although you could do that just by swapping out gears. Uh, there, you know, in the right ballpark. Right. Um, okay, so part of the part of the so dealing with inconsistent flow so sometimes that inconsistent flow in the in the extruder can come from inconsistent input into the extruder um, so just like if you think about uh, how say pellets or flakes right. flow through a hopper um, and so the industry is using pellets because they flow quite evenly um, right do flakes, which are much more like leaves off of a tree, they don't flow very well, they tend to clump up on each other, and you know, you get like little avalanches, you know, so mm -hmm. that inconsistency, and sometimes they completely just jam up, and you get problems like, it's called rat holing, or bridging. Hold on a second, when you say flakes, are these flakes that you grind yourself? Yeah, so if you check out, um, let's see here, if you go to the, uh, the Tech for Trade web uh, uh, GitHub and click on Thunderhead Filament Extruder, uh, there's a README. So if you scroll down to the, on that README, um, just the, there's a picture just under the title, you know, just a paragraph under the title and it shows a picture of me holding some flakes. Oh, yeah. So that's what the flake is. Those are self-ground? Yeah, so we, that's another thing that's got to get documented and up there is that we made our own grinder um, to produce our own flakes. Um, and that, we didn't want to do that, uh, but we ended up doing it because we had so many issues with uh, getting grinders that were low cost, not three phase, and produced even consistent like. What's your price bill of materials cost on a grinder? On the grinder, the bill of materials is, um, okay, without, the, if, if we don't include the motor, it's probably about a hundred and Twenty-five to one hundred and fifty dollars with the motor. So add add a third of a horsepower motor onto that. Um, in Tanzania, sorry, in Nairobi, we had to pay two hundred bucks for our motor because it was the only decent one we could source. Uh -huh. um, here, I had one sitting in my shop from an old Craftsman table saw. Price of that motor could vary. You know, the, the variation in the price of the motor is on order of the cost of the rest of the motor. Um, and so that that was another issue that I was gonna gonna put on our our document. Um, so oh good, there's the the grinder. I can, um, let's see here, do I have a picture? Well, I'll get, I, we can deal with pictures of the grinder later on. I'll, you know, I'll put it, make a whole repository with all the designs and everything. So it's mainly 3D printed. Um, oh, do you have a picture of it? Can you just show me one? Let me oh, yeah, I probably do. 
do. Let me see if I can. I can. And and have you compared it to the precious plastic grinder? It's totally different ballpark. It's like a different machine altogether. Yeah. is on my Google Drive still. If it is, I can just share that video. Yeah. I did share... Did I share the, the From Bottle to Print video with you? No. Wait, that's got, a, that's got an old... It's got an old uh, grinder. On, it's like so much stuff is old on there. Um, but here, I might as well just share it with you so you can... Yeah. So I just sent you, um, I just shared with you a the last one I did, which is ends in 007, is the, is the video of the chopper. Can you paste that into the Jitsi Meet chat box? Oh, it's not on, not on YouTube? YouTube. I have, haven't got around to getting set up on YouTube yet, although I think we have a Tech for Trade channel, um, so I will um, get that wrong. Okay, let's see. Here's the link. Oh, I, I see what you're doing. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so it's like not... A totally different, yeah, that's why I was like, it's a totally different beat than... Oh, man. Precious plastic. So where, where the plastic, precious plastic just kind of grinds it up into random shapes and sizes and is far, far, far more powerful, this is... makes... I mean, if you look at the picture that I that I um, that's on the, the repository, if you look at the flakes, you'll see they're like extremely uniform. Um, uh, do you think that you can do the same with another kind of grinder, or do you really need these kinds of uniform flakes? Um. So. The answer is I'm not sure, but um, have a suspicion that okay. So, so the, I'll just give you the thinking behind it, which is industry uses uniform pellets because they flow uniformly, they melt uniformly, right. they move in the extruder. You know, there's just um, if you're trying to make a uniform product, that helps quite a bit. And so, my thought was okay, well, we're not using pellets. How can we turn, how can we make flakes that are as close to pellets as possible? Right. Um, also, if you look at the size of the flakes I'm making, they're like... Tiny. 
four millimeters by four millimeters. Whereas if you look at the size of the plastic coming out of the precious plastic machine, I'll bet it's far larger. Right. Uh, then the other thing that happens, but so you say, okay, well, I, my grinder only makes big flakes. So the way I'm going to get smaller stuff, I'm going to run it through again. And that helps, but the other thing that you face then are the fines. So as you get like fine particles in there, those things melt more quickly than the rest of the flakes. So they may stick to the barrel earlier, and then you know you may even get issues with like what are called melt plugs. Yeah. The other thing I don't know if you noticed in the feed throat of the extruder, there are grooves in the feed throat. So the feed throat is is the, the part of the barrel where the plastic goes like directly from the hopper when it first gets into that open spot in the barrel. Uh huh. Um, if you look at that part uh, more closely, you'll see there are grooves cut into the inside of the barrel. And those grooves, basically, when a flake gets an edge that goes into that groove, it will resist rotating around in circles with the screw. <clears throat> so as the screw turns, the flake must move down the barrel. Um, and so that really oh, helps yeah. kind of the extruder get better grip on the flakes and push them into the machine. Um, the grooves allow grooves, allow the better grip to happen. Yeah, yeah. Because in an extruder, what you want is you want grip on the walls of the barrel and slip on the screw. Um, so the screw, as the screw turns, basically it's just, you know, the, the, the flake is slipping on the face of the screw, but in order to slip, it's got to move forward, you know, when it slips. If it grips on the screw, then it just goes around in circles. And at the very beginning, when the flakes go into the machine, they tend to want to slip on everything. They want to slip on the barrel and on the screw. So those grooves allow for the flakes to grip on the barrel and get them started down the screw, down the, huh. down the barrel. And if they don't grip on the barrel, they're just rotating without... Yeah, so like later yeah. on, if you have... If, so, so sometimes, let's say you turn the, the machine on, the, the extruder on, and you let it heat up, but you don't extrude. Um, if you let it sit long enough, sometimes what will happen is the molten plastic will flow backwards and then get to a, a part closer to the hopper and where it's not as hot and solidify back there. And if yeah. that happens and then you, you uh, start running the machine as the plastic's cooling down, it'll freeze onto the screw and you'll get what's called a melt plug, just a plug of plastic that goes around with the, with the screw and doesn't move down the length of the barrel huh. but yeah so you, you want the plastic to slide on the screw and rip on the barrel and that translates into the plastic being forced down the barrel towards the nozzle Wow. Okay, so this is very special for, like, this wouldn't work with pellets. This would work with your flakes. Oh, the, the, the grooves? No, the grooves, actually, um, I learned about that from researching industrial machines. They do all sorts of different things to improve the grip on the barrel at the feed throat. Um, so there are companies that make feed throats with special materials that you know, you match the material to your plastic and it grips more strongly. Um, and also, you can play with temperature, right? So if you think about a, a plastic that melts it or gets soft at a lower temperature, what you might do is keep the feed throat to a certain temperature and actually, you know, actively maintain the feed throat at, I don't know, whatever temperature. And 
plastic may soften enough that it that it um, you know gets a better grip on the on the barrel than it does on the screw. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, there's just, I mean, I, I've learned a lot working on this stuff. There's just, um, you know, is, there's, um, there's so many little details. Yes, indeed. Are pellets, going to pellets, an option? Not really, right? Because that's... Uh, uh, that's, that's totally an option. Um, that's just uh, not, not in, in it, uh, like, I'm not so interested in, in going the pellets route. Because you want DIY, local production. Yeah, so, um, I mean, so there's a whole other, uh, again, when the wiki's done, there, all this information will be up there. But, um, Do you have a wiki address yet? Uh, Sagan? Oh, Do yeah, you? I put the addresses in the, the, in the very top. Oh, the GitHub is a wiki? When you go to that. So GitHub comes with, yeah, that's what, the reason why I decided to go with GitHub was because if you... Go to the, just go to the, the filament extruder uh, folder. Uh huh. And then if you notice on the tabs, there's a code tab and issues tab, pull requests, projects, and then the next one is wiki. Oh, wiki, yeah. And so I haven't started loading into the wiki yet, um, but basically what will happen is the readme file. Uh, you know, there's no way I'm going to be able to get into all the detail in a one-page readme. So it's going to have links into the more meat of the documentation process and you know, we'll have yeah. videos on YouTube that are, that are linked into the wiki, and, you know, photos and you know, kind of all that, all that extra background information that, that kind of says, okay, that's why I'm doing this, or if I'm thinking about changing it, arm yourself with some some knowledge before you know so you, you make informed uh, change decisions. How do you make the feed throat? <laughs> so what I do is I um, I get that piece of pipe yep. and you know I cut out the the slot for the plastic to go through. I just use my mill for that but you know you could I have Used a grinder and a hacksaw and a file before. And, you know, mm -hmm. but you can do it. Um, and then what I do is I put a hacksaw. I, I put a hacksaw together with the blade going through the. Um, oh wow! Yeah. Through that little section, and then I just, you know, you start slow, and once you get a groove going, you can just saw a nice even groove down. Um, I think the professional way to do that would be to use approach yeah um but again you know i was like thinking like okay how many people that are going to build this machine are going to have a uh, setup for broaching including myself <laughs> yeah and the hacksaw trick actually that's uh one of the less difficult parts i would say like and it's just a hacksaw with of the groove yeah yeah 125 125th of an inch is what I'm reading off the CAD oh I think I just picked something yeah um, so it's just tiny grooves yeah yeah they're just little grooves you know some just just enough to, to get a grip on the, on the flakes um, right that, you know it was amazing because I was I, actually I I took the rest of the barrel off of the extruder, so it was just the feed throat kind of feeding into, you know, onto the table. And I ran the extruder without the grooves and was feeding flakes in, and they were, there, you know, because when I when I moved to PEP, I was just getting really terrible feed, and so they're barely moving through. And then I switched to the grooves, and all of a sudden. I started getting a really nice flow. That's interesting. So the flakes would just spin around. What is it about the groove that so it catches on a groove and then the flute, the flighting, 
have, can yeah. at that point push it along. It's kind of, yeah. is that like, do you understand it very clearly? That's, that's almost counterintuitive. So think about it like, um, okay, let's say you are, you're standing in a tunnel and, um, if there's a groove in the floor that goes down the tunnel, right, and say your feet are locked into that, so yeah. you, can't, you can't get pushed up the wall, when that yeah. screw turns, as your butt slides against the screw, yeah. right, the, the wall is moving forward. Yeah, yeah. No, Almost that's true. As if you're up so, so as the wall slides past your butt, because your feet are not flying out from under you, your feet are going to go sliding down that yeah. that trough. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, that was actually a big lesson for me when I when I learned about um, you know you want slip on the screw and stick on the barrel. Hmm. You know, and I think they'll like in the industry sometimes they'll go to to really far lengths to get that like actively cooling the screw um, with like a cooling channel down the middle of the screw or something like that. Uh, don't quote me on that. But, uh, but, you know, um, they do do a lot of, of, of work to control that, that, uh, that dynamic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so how? Then, so did you need those? If you have pellets, it's much easier to get them to slide along. Like with the flakes, you need the grooves. Is that the idea? Because um, no, I haven't. So I haven't had like a easy access to. I mean, so like again, our goal, right, is being able to run this in in somewhere where like you don't have to go out and import something. So like pellets. Um, you know, PET pellets are, uh, my guess is, uh, almost a hundred percent imported into East Africa. Um, and they, they actually go through quite big lengths to get the plastic right for those pellets. Um, so remember I was telling you about how, uh, the plastic is low viscosity. The story gets worse than that. Um, the uh, plastic is very hygroscopic, so it pulls water out of the air. And when it pulls water out of the air, then when you heat it up, uh, the polymer can undergo hydrolysis and the chains break down. So the viscosity goes down even lower. Um, so um, in industry, when they get those flakes, um, which have already been processed once, so they're already slightly degraded, um, what they will do is uh, use a variety of techniques to uh, extend the chains and improve the viscosity of the plastic. Um, and so when they make those pellets, they'll sell them like these pellets have X viscosity, um, you know, or actually they use a they use a different type of measurement. It's called melt index. Um, Sorry, what index? Uh, melt index. But then actually melt for index. PET they use even a more specialized um, term, which is uh, intrinsic viscosity, um, because <laughs> they have this crazy way of measuring. Um, basically an analog of the viscosity of the, of the plastic because when you heat it up it starts breaking down and changing so the actual viscosity you measure is so dependent on the particular situation you're measuring it in they, they opted for a different kind of uh, uh, measurement to, to help make it more uniform and that's called the, the intrinsic viscosity, where I'm pretty sure what you do to measure the intrinsic viscosity is you mix the plastic with a really nasty 
um, solute, like something that dissolves it, and then you measure the viscosity of that. And that mm -hmm. way you can get away a with doing that at a temperature where the plastic doesn't break down. So they, to increase the viscosity, they process it mechanically somehow to make the pellets? So there are a few ways you can do that. You can add chemicals to the melt called uh, chain extenders, um, which is basically like, say, adding epoxy to the mix. Yeah. And those chain extenders just grab one end of one chain and they start looking and as soon as they find another chain, they just grab onto that. And so like if you, I, ha I was talking with uh, some folks that said, yeah, you can use them. You just have to be really careful because if you get too much in, your plastic will set up like epoxy inside of your extruder and just glue the whole thing together. <laughs> you won't be able to melt. Like it'll be done. Yeah. Um, so another way, and I haven't, again, these are just like things I've, you know, say like seen brief mention of, but I haven't really researched them because they're beyond our capability. But I think if you heat the plastic up in a vacuum and hold it at a certain temperature and keep it moving for a certain amount of time, that the chains will naturally um, start joining yeah. each other. But basically, with either of these, you just like have your target intrinsic viscosity and you just continuously figure out how long you have to process to get there yeah. um, or how much additive you have to add. So for us, it's kind of the opposite. We just want to like process as little as possible to just maintain the quality that we have. Yeah. Are you going always from bottles? It will be bottles yeah, and so drugs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going from bottles. There's a, another group. You remember a while ago when we were like kind of cold feet on stuff? Um, that was because our previous experience with another group that um, wanted to basically do exactly the same thing. Um, and they've ended up in India and they're using pellets. And that's one of their ways of improving consistency. Yeah. Again, right. but, you know, for us, it's like, you know, so then you're still tied into the giant industrial chain and you're tied into imports. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to do, like, if you think about, say, like a small scale recycling program where you're using pellets, then what you're doing is you're collecting your bottles, sending them to China, importing pellets from China, and then making whatever it is. When at that point it's probably easier to make the, the thing in China as well. Um, so we're like, nope, we're just going to do go straight to Flake, uh, extrude straight from Flake, and skip all that middle business. Uh, PET includes polyester. That's essentially polyester. Uh, yeah, that's so. Like um, a lot of our say fleece and stuff like that. That's what happens is it gets sent to uh, another country and then recycled into, you know, pop bottles and things like that get recycled in the piece. Oh, wow. Um, have you ever explored the idea of making insulation by just doing spaghetti with a 3D printer with a small nozzle to make insulation? Uh, there, there are uh, actual machines that do that. There's, um, I don't know if it's open source oh, what's it called it looks like a cotton candy making machine uh -huh. and, and if if you look you'll see like um i've seen youtube videos they to me i feel like the ones i've seen have come from russia um You, you think there was an open source project that did that somewhere? Um, let, me, let me see if I can find one. If you send me an email, I can take some more time and, and 
Uh, uh, right now, everything I'm getting is solid bottles and not. Um, uh, right. And the, the drill driven shredder, is that a drill driven shredder there? The oh, uh, that drill. So that was just for testing with the drill. I normally put a motor onto it. Um, so that yeah, that if you did you look at the the other link I sent you, the one with the um, it shows yeah. just the the machine running with the four. It starts out with the four strands coming in. Right. Right. So tell me about the scalability of the kind of a process. Though it's like, yeah, I like it, except to basically yeah, string out bottles, man. It's so I would say that that was like our kind of okay. How do we get consistent flake, um, cheap, you know, on a small scale? And that was kind of like first stab, um, and. What I have to say about the, the chopper is that it is ultra slow. Um, and so like in the US, there is no way you could operate that machine and make money. With it. Like one person working all day could make a half a bucket to a bucket. <laughs> like what's the, what's the solution? Bucket. Do you see a solution? What's that? Do you see a solution? Um, so it's something that, that we got to work on. So, so a few thoughts are like, you know, so slowly move. Um, so one idea is there's a, a group in, um, in, uh, where in the Caribbean, um, somewhere, uh, so the name of their islands is not coming to mind. Right now. Um, but anyhow, they, um, they use paper shredders and, issue that they have is that the, the gears break all the time, you know, because the paper shredders come up like plastic gears and they're running them like all day really hard. Um, so the paper shredders, like if you've got a cross cut paper shredder, so really similar design to the precious plastic thing, just smaller scale, mm -hmm. um, that might do it. They so they also run their flakes through multiple times to get to get small enough sizes. Um, you know, so there may be. I, I've been daydreaming on a way. You know, like let's say you know if you have a paper shredder or something similar to that that cuts strips instead of uh, the cross cuts. If yeah. You could get. Uh, some sort of mechanism that as the strips come out, they get fed in perpendicular on another one, then you would get uh, nicely diced up flakes. Or maybe there's a cutter geometry uh, that we could use that just, you know, bites flakes out. Um, you know, I'm not sure, but that's uh, one of the areas where I'm thinking pretty hard uh, and the paper we'll, shredders we'll, we'll they just we'll have to think pretty hard because our, our current solution is good enough that we can we can move with it and we can we can um, make filament but uh, you know I would say in Nairobi with, so we hired a guy to, to do that work and he's probably about break even in terms of cost, you know, like, um, you know, what we're paying him is pretty much like what the plastic's worth by the time it's done, you know, and wages are quite a bit less in Nairobi than they are here. Do you see a, as a solution the idea of, of screens that you, you do a shredder and then you have, you have sizing, grading of size? Yeah, that's a great, um, so we did use that in Tanzania. Um, we used uh, uh, more like, we, we just used industrial shredders and you run the, the, fill, the flakes through a few times and then you 
um, basically run them through screens and get the fines out and get the big pieces out. Um, and I think that's probably also a viable option. Um, the flakes won't be as uniform, but I don't think that's absolutely critical. I mean, I think we're maybe a little bit hyper <laughs> in terms of like trying to get ultra uniform feedstock. Um, it, I think part of the thought is just like completely eliminate one variable um, and until we until we you know keep eliminating variables until we figure out what's what the key issues are and then we can start tightening the clamps on other things. Um, but yeah, I think you could probably like uh, say a good way for, for you guys to start. What, what, what I would be tempted to do is find a, do you have three phase power at your place? Yeah. So if you have three phase power, I would find a, a used, uh, grinder that will do PET, you know, and just buy one of those and it'll fly through, uh, you know, or you can make you can actually you could make that. They're they're not ultra complicated complicated machines. So do a do a what a grinder a plastic grinder a commercial plastic. Yeah, yeah granulator. The technical name I guess would be granulator. Um, oh, it's got blades in it. It's uh, the way it works is yeah, is it's just like a couple of rotating blades and a couple of stationary blades, and then a screen. And so it just keeps re-chopping plastic until it fits through the screen. Um, it's like another issue that we found with, with those things when we were just trying to buy them, is that the screens they come with are typically for 12 millimeter size flakes, which is kind of a, a standard, but it's, it's really big, so they, they clump together and they don't fit into our extruder anyway. So, um, what do they we, use the flakes for? Use, what's that? What do they use the flakes, the 12 millimeter flakes for? In industry, so what they'll do, they have like huge uh, extruders where the size of that flake is still small compared to the rest of the machine. Okay, yeah. So they fit in the barrel and, you know. And then they'll take those and, and extrude them into pellets. Yeah. And that's, okay. that's probably the point at which they m either mix in a chain extension compound or... You know, um, but yeah, you could, you know, the, the thing for, again, for us, you know, the consideration was a little bit different in that most of the places where we were looking at extruding didn't have three phase hookups and so three the cost of a three phase hookup you know it's like probably around a thousand bucks um which is a significant cost um and delay uh so we're looking for smaller scale options yeah and the granulators if we can make us um just a finer screen, then we'd be okay, right? Yeah. No. So, so something. If you, say, if you guys would be interested, I would absolutely love to work on a, because I mean, like the smallest industrial granulator yeah. will produce multiple, multiple, multiple times the amount of plastic than you're going. You know, um, unless you like have 10 extruders or 20 extruders running or something like that. Like, you know, you're going to run the, the granulator for a few minutes and then extrude for a few days. Um, yeah, we'll definitely so, want to do it. I mean, absolutely. Uh, do you know the geometry of the knives and blades? Do you, do you have that info? If you can pass it on to me, we'll just design it and prototype it. Yeah, they vary. I think for PET, um, it's typically recommended that you use like a scissor type cut. Um, so the blade on the anvil and the blade on the uh, uh, the rotor are both um, tipped a little bit in opposite directions, kind of like a push lawnmower. Uh huh. Um, on blade angles, I'm not sure. 
30, around 30 degrees or 20 degrees comes to mind, pretty steep blade angle. Um, but it's something, so like what I was going to say that I would be interested in, is that, you know, coming up with, with a version of one of those that isn't three feathers. Definitely. I mean, that's easy. No problem. I mean, it's not a big yeah. deal. It's just a different motor. Yeah, it's just I mean, getting a different motor and, you know, maybe downsizing uh, the capacity. What I'm thinking actually right okay. now, uh, just if you talk about product ecology, is a system where you have a hydraulic power cube like we use normally, like you saw in the tractor, and use that for mm -hmm. hydraulic drive so that you can actually in interchange the motor from the granulator to the extruder even in the extreme case. But hydraulics would be an easy oh. way to drive it. I mean, hydraulic engines, hydraulic motors are relatively inexpensive. They're like a hundred bucks for multiple horsepower scale. Um, so um, that's one option to go. But yeah, yeah, I definitely want to look at the granulator. If, can you send me any more info on the what you know about the blade design? The rotor design, yeah. Yeah, it's um. I think where there was a. It's like an old plastics recycling manual that I saw that was like you can buy them or you can build them yourself. Um, and then it was like kind of like almost it's so easy that you you uh, you know they didn't really give. Specifics. It was probably not that it was so easy, but that. It was not the right spot to go into the details. Right. But I, I, I may have some stuff. I'll, I'll dig around. Um, one interesting thing that I did learn about granulators when I was in Tanzania um, is that so if you uh, if you do the the what was it? Um, so the way I'm imagining this, and this may be totally wrong, it's my kind of conceptualization of everything, but so normally a granulator, as it's re-chopping all of this flake into small pieces, um, it's kind of like luck if the smallest piece is smaller than the screen fall through the screen. And sometimes they get recycled back through and cut even smaller, and so you end up with lots of fines. And the fines are a problem. I mean. They're a problem to the point where when you buy flake industrially, a typical spec is the percentage of fines. Or if you buy a, a granulator, it'll tell you how much fine it produces. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, fancy granulators, I think they're designed to like operate under partial vacuum so that fines are actually pulled through the the screen and, and get out of the area where things are being cut like as soon as they're small enough um, and that way reduces the amount of fines and improves the quality of the flake quite a bit. Right. Um, so that might, you know, uh, I'll, I'll try and look up some, you know, so, so that could be as simple as like hooking a shop back onto collection bin and just having the bin actually seal on the machine a bit. Um, but yeah, I would be, I, I feel like that could definitely be a device that say, uh, you know, CNC plasma table or torch table, cut yeah. out you know your main parts. And then, yeah, definitely. You know, that's a nice place. The thing, it, it would be one thing that would be pretty awesome to be able to do is to use um, uh, like the most common blades. I feel like that I could find for things would be like uh, planar blades for woodworking or something like that, you know, so you get like a good hardened steel um, and then just re-grinding an edge on them versus like trying to find tool steel and grind your blades from scratch. 
um, might be difficult in certain areas of the world. Um, whereas buying a, a replacement blade for a plane or something like that might be quite easy. Right. Uh, so that, I, that's kind of what we did on that chopper, actually use um, joiner blades. Uh huh. And you're gonna document that that part, so I can take a look at what that's. You're uh, so now that I'm back here, kind of the next like until I'm until I'm done with all the documentation, will be for me to just get all this information up on our repository. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good. Hey, it's uh, we've been at it for two hours today. Maybe um, let's see, we should uh, we should meet uh, meet again on this. Can we do it again? Maybe next Tuesday. Yeah, sure. That um, that works great. Uh, Same time. Let's let's do that again and continue the discussion. Um, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, that's great. Well, to summarize for today, then yeah, I mean we went over a lot of stuff here, and. Um, let's see, so to summarize, uh, what are the main points here? Uh, were you thinking that, well, first of all, what just to summarize, what, what are the things that you are thinking of definitely doing for the next iteration? Like if you talk about the, the extruder itself. Okay, um, so for the next iteration, the, um, I mean, there's some, there's so, some detail cleanup, kind of just like things that have been in the design or just because of the history of the design that, um, you know, I just want to design them for this iteration of the machine. So it'll be like, cleaning up the frame shapes and making all the new electronics fit in the box, stuff like that. Um, in terms of the main issues, one of the, the next things will be to get the diameter sensors performing. Uh, better and getting that feedback control, uh, you know, figuring out how to to get that working well. Um, I mean, let me just ask work. you. Can I can I ask you yeah, when you run when you run your filament maker right now? How much are you going? Are you typically capable of producing before some mess up? I mean, can you run it for like an hour without any problem, or for five minutes a day? So, let's see, I guess we can run, um, maybe I'll say like this, in an hour, you make, say, a spool of filament, and that spool of filament, when we remove the bad spots, will turn into, I don't know, maybe five pieces of filament or so. Mm-hmm. And then, so remember that what so so the diameter in there could actually vary quite a bit, and it's fine for us because there's the diameter sensor on the printer. Um, so, um, and then the other thing is, on the printer because of that diameter sensor, there's runout detection. So if we hit the end of a of a section of filament, the printer will just tell you to add more filament, and you can keep going so you don't lose your print. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, right now, probably around five pieces of filament. That'll probably change pretty quickly as the as the diameter sensor kind of eliminates those those large and small. Actions. And when you say unusable, what's that mean? Like below one and above like three or like? So that would bad? be, yeah, like above two millimeters. Basically just won't fit into the printer. And then below like 1.2 millimeters is where really it just buckles so much that, that uh, you don't get good, good extrusion. Um, you know, but like I said at the beginning of the call, typically we'll run for a stretch at a time between 1.6, 1.8, around in there. 
you know, sometimes dipping down, you know, a little, dipping a little out of that, a little out of that zone. Uh, when you say it buckles with 1.2 millimeter, is that direct drive or Bowden? Direct drive. So you've got that like few inches of distance between where the cold end is pushing and the. Um, and so if, if it's, you know, say the barrel, the, the, the center bore in there is like um, two millimeters in diameter. And so if you put something that's 1.2 millimeters in there, it'll start buckling inside of, inside of that space. And it makes it so that adjusting the extrusion speed um, doesn't really work so well. Yeah, because I'm just thinking about, well, what if we make crap filament, but that always works? Because if you have a filament sensor with sensor on the yeah, printer exactly. itself... You, you make crappy filament, but I, I mean, that's... Ex like. The cube that we showed you that you know that filament was all crazy diameters right but that but uh, that makes the case for going to three millimeters though because you can't be below yes, a certain yes, thing that's true. The, so going to three millimeters we will have to probably change the diameter sensor slightly on the printer to just to accommodate the larger filament but yeah I agree with you totally on that like you got a stiffer filament um, and yeah, you know, we could set our, our standard diameter even at like 2.5, say, so we've got quite a bit of distance above and below. And yeah, you could make really yeah, crazy I mean, film. No, I mean, I'd say, I'd say that sounds like a good solution. I mean, as long as you're correcting that on the printer itself, I mean, who cares? Yeah, yeah, and then it it eliminates a lot of the complexity on the extruder. Um, right. You know, because you can, like, at that point, you may even be able to just eliminate the diameter sensors completely, maybe have one on there just to make sure you're in the right range. Um, there's a, we didn't really talk about the star feeder too much, um, you know, but that's like basically trying to regulate the inflow of plastic. To, to pin down that variable, um, you could probably eliminate that. You know, so, you, so we might be able to reduce a lot of the extrusion complexity just by making the printers able to handle whatever we throw at them. Right. Do you know on standard printers, what's if you're using three, mil, three millimeter filament, how large it can be before it doesn't fit down the throat? Not off the top of my head. My guess would be probably just over three millimeters, three point one or so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was trying even like, I mean, what's the limit of the thickest filament? I mean, say we make our own extruders for three D printers, which we can. I mean, we we'll probably get to that. But I'm thinking for larger scale prints. Well, I mean, what's the maximum practical limit? I mean, is it four millimeters, five millimeters, maybe? So. Printing large, so I was talking with Gigabot um, on this. Are, are you familiar with that? Uh, sorry, their name's uh, Reef uh, Yeah, I've heard of them, yeah. Okay, so they make these big, huge printers called Gigabots. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about, uh, you know, say printing large with PET. And one of the issues there in terms of throughput will become the cooling of the plastic while you're printing. Um, and I also actually talked with um, with Ultimaker um, years and years ago. They had a huge printer that, you know, their idea was basically the same thing. People throw bottles in and they get ground up and then printed. And they said, basically, another big problem is the crystallization of plastic. And if it doesn't cool quickly enough, it will crystallize you're laying down a big fat bead of plastic, it's not going to cool fast enough. Uh, specifically for PET, what about other plastics? Do they also crystallize or not, not as much? So say for like PLA, you could do it. Mm -hmm. um, PLA does crystallize, but it crystallizes quickly, so it's not a, as brittle. Um, 
The other thing that might be possible with PET is to use an additive. Like say you could add um, talc or sodium benzoate, I think, to the flakes when you extrude them, and that'll actually force it to crystallize faster so you get smaller crystals. You know, kind of like fine grain size and steel or something like that. Um, Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So it'll, you know, it'll be more brittle than the amorphous stuff, but uh, it will, you know, hopefully be so glass, you know, behave like a glass. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's it's critical for what for safety or like some products can some products be brittle? Uh, like where where is brittleness acceptable? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it'd be fine in in products that are that are. But it's okay for it to be brittle. That would be fine. Um, you know, like for example, if you're trying to print out plastic lumber sections, you know, say it's like a piece on a we use as a board on the aquaponic ponds, can it be brittle? Relatively so. I mean. Yeah. So there. Boy, I guess it really depends on how you know what kind of shocks. Right. Subjected to. Um, if I was going to do plastic lumber, I would definitely not use three D printing as the process. Mm-hmm. I would, you know, look more towards, you know, just injecting into a form or, or even, um, you know, like uh, what do they call it? Kind of a combination of injection and compression molding. Um, where there's like a uh, there's your mold that you fill with plastic, and then you also have like a secondary piston. So like as the as the mold comes under compression, a piston also like kind of finishes it off, like fills in the, the rest. I might do some, try to do something like that. Um, yeah. Three D printing would just be way too slow to process all that plastic. Um, Although large scale three D printing for complex shapes, you know, you can make you know I mean even just think about like how long it takes a woodworker to make a table or something like that, you know, like, you know, you could you could do very complex geometries that you know you wouldn't even be able to get, say, with a CNC router. Um, Right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's maybe quit here. But maybe, um, maybe for the next discussion, could we maybe, I mean, it seems to me like going to three millimeters would make a lot of sense. Uh, can we maybe yeah. focus yeah. the discussion going to that? Uh, sure. I'm not positive. I'll have a, a ton to say at this point besides let's try it. Um, I don't very. I don't think we would have to actually modify the machine much at all. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know the the curves. We may have to like smooth out some of the curves because it won't be able to bend as easily. But besides that, I don't. I don't see anything that we would actually change immediately okay make it happen. yeah okay okay um, yeah I just today I wanted to, to make sure you guys are aware of some of the challenges yeah both in terms of the material and where we are in development so that you know as we move forward if, if those are like Oh, uh, no, this is something we're not interested in. You know, just to make sure you're you're still interested in it. And, yeah. And, no, definitely interested. Yeah. I mean, you, you guys got a lot of experience on this, and it's worth building upon it, I think. And, uh, yeah, 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 I, I, think, I think we should go forward with it. I mean, it's, I think w- once awesome. refined a little bit, I mean, man, uh, someone's got to do it, I think, is the bottom line, you know. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Once once we get the recipe cracked, then it's just you know it's, uh, just repeat, right? Yeah, yeah, and and I mean it's worth investing into because I, I mean I'm not seeing 
besides you guys, who else has taken a serious stab at it? I mean, who is the most serious next player on it? Uh, my guess would be Reflow, but they've pretty much just copied all of our work. Right. Um, and they're not going to to the flake, they're going with pellets. Um, have you considered, you know, if we got some appropriate technology equipment to actually make pellets, would that be a worthwhile route at all? If that could be, well, could yes, be internalized? Well, we've thought, we've talked about it. Um, the things that I can think, so it could definitely improve the processing. Um, the issue that I see is that the plastic is gaining another heat cycle. Right. Um, so one, after after making the pellets, you have to re-dry the plastic again before you, you can extrude it because it goes into a water bath. Um, unless we can find a way to, to maybe not use a water bath there. But anyhow, you got to make sure it's, it's dry. And then also when you add a heat cycle, so it degrades more so... Um, that may or may not, it may not be an issue for 3D printing. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but then it just adds another step to the process. But you right. could potentially, like one thing we're thinking about doing um, is all that, like when you start up the machine, uh, you end up, like as the machine kind of attains the equilibrium, you end up with a bunch of filament that you've extruded that's not in spec and so that stuff we want to just grind back up and use as pellets for extruding so one of our thoughts would be that we would save that you know so let's say every x number of times you extrude you know you end up with a bucket of pellets and then you can extrude those um, that stuff it maybe if it extrudes better in the flakes maybe we just extrude everything twice Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. There, there, are lot of, there are, I mean, I think there, the important thing, there's a, there's a lot of different stuff we can try. And I think historically we've just been pinned down that really it's only me and my shop working on it. Right. So there's just been a, a limited capacity of, of, different things I can, I can mess around with. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's let's continue the discussion next week and, and just get more familiar with this. I think this was really productive and we can uh, make some decisions yeah. on what we could do. Yeah, I'd love to do a workshop yeah. on this and um, make one of these things. So, okay. Well, Sounds great. Yeah, yeah I mean, Matt, well, thanks so much you for your time then. So let's let's talk again next, next week, 2 p.m. on Tuesday okay. again. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dan. Mm -hmm. Yep. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.